John D. Nicola and Stacey Widlett are acclaimed singer-songwriters known for their contributions to the iconic film Dirty Dancing. D. Nicola co-wrote the classic hits I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes, while Widlett co-composed She's Like the Wind, which reached number three on the US Billboard charts. And John and Stacey are with us. How are you both today? Good, good. Doing well. We have a, a nice sunny <laughs> day here in New York. Oh, yes, lovely. Same here. Yeah. yeah. Now, John, what is all that stuff behind you? Because that oh. looks very technical. <laughs> well, I'm in a recording, my recording studio in my barn, and oh. that's all gear used to record people. Now, of course, you're both known for composing some dirty dancing songs. So, John, first of all, what was the creative process behind the songs you co-wrote, I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes? Well, uh, I had uh, been working with Frankie Previtt, who is the co-writer on those songs, um, uh, and um, he was looking for songs for a new record for Frankie and the Knockouts. He had been dropped from his label and looking to write new songs. And he had heard the track of Hungry Eyes. Uh, the Hungry Eyes, you know well, musically, if you just took the vocal off, that's what he heard. And and uh, he said he'd like to write something to that. This was for Frankie and the Knockouts. Yeah. And um, he did. Uh, he heard it and he wrote, he took it home and wrote, uh, you know, we finished uh, the song Hungry Eyes together. That was the first song we wrote together. We probably wrote maybe five or six, seven other songs for that uh, record. Um, but in the middle of writing, Frankie got a call from his, the old uh, record label head, Jimmy Einer, who was the music director for the movie Dirty Dancing. And he said, listen, there's a space. There's, they're looking for a song for the closing scene of this movie. And, uh, you know, they've, they've been looking for a long time. And as the story goes, um, there were 150 other songs or whatever. They were yeah. getting ready to film to a, a Lionel Richie track. And uh, then they heard uh, this song. But in the midst of recording for Frankie, Jimmy called and said, listen, you got to try and write this song. And this wasn't like it was a gig given to us. We were in there with everybody else in the world, you know, trying to get a song. So... You know, Frankie said, you know, I'm trying to get a record deal. I, I don't know if I have time. And Jimmy said, make time. I think it'll change your life. And that's how that song uh, got into the movie. And then um, a little while later, they called us in and they needed a song for the I Carried a Watermelon scene. Yes. And, and we went in and we had Hungry Eyes. And they said, uh, yeah, it's not quite right for that scene. I think they ended up using uh, Love Man and uh, uh, what's the other? one uh, i can't think of the other one uh for that scene they said but you know we might have this other scene that would work for hungry eyes and of course that part is uh, rest is history they did that kind of menage a trois scene with the the um uh, cynthia rhodes and jennifer patrick teaching jennifer and uh, as it was told to me, the uh, when he put his uh, arm, his finger down her side uh, in that scene, she really did laugh, and and he was getting annoyed. It wasn't that wasn't you know in the script, and yes. um, they uh, cleverly uh, kept it in there. Yeah. So that's those few songs. I should mention the time of my life it was me, Frankie Previtt, and a guy named Donald Marco. It's Donnie and I did the music, and the same thing. Frankie heard the music and wrote to it. And the time. Of of my life in particular i guess it's a movie that we remember all the songs very well but that seems to be like the standout song so what do you think it was about it that made it stand out yeah i it's uh first of all it closes this the, the movie it, it it's structured musically uh, i think to to kind of push and pull you know the verse is is very you know tension relax tension relax and then when that chorus hits it is a huge release and i think the whole movie kind of builds towards this release you know johnny comes back he, he grabs baby he says the hell with all you people this yeah. is what we're doing and it's like a, it's what everybody wanted to see and hear 
and, and you you really notice it almost more in and you know there's a play version um of dirty dancing in fact it's been in the uk for a long time all over and um you really almost sense it more in the play it's like it's just a big kind of build to the climactic you know explosion and you know yeah. the dancing and you know it didn't hurt that uh patrick was an amazing dancer and you know just uh, uh as El emil artelino who um directed the movie said it was kind of a something that just fell together you know that you couldn't have thought it out and tried to place this together this just fell the sun, the moon, the stars lined up, right actors, right songs, uh, right script. And, uh, you know, we're still talking about it uh, 35 years later. Now, Stacey, you co-wrote She's Like the Wind with Patrick Swayze. How did that actually end up in the film? Because it wasn't actually intended for Dirty Dancing originally, was it? No, um, he and I were friends. Uh, we actually, we lived around the block from each other um, in the uh, early to mid 80s. And um, we, I mean, literally two houses away. Yeah. And uh, we had become friends and his wife, Lisa, and my then girlfriend, Wendy, you know, we would all get together. And, um, and I was writing music for television uh, a lot with, with Wendy, actually, doing theme songs for, um, at that time, mostly daytime television shows. And so he knew I was a professional composer. And um, he called me up one day and he said, um, uh, he was working on a movie called Grandview USA with Tommy Howell and Jamie Lee Curtis. And he said, hey, they're looking for songs for Grandview. Um, I've had this idea for a song for a couple of years, but can't get anywhere with it. You want to work on it with me? So I said, yeah, sure, come on over. So, I mean, he lived around the block. So he walked on over uh, that evening with his guitar and I was at my piano in my apartment. And um, he played me what he had, which was just two chords, um, C to E minor. and But he had a lot of lyrics, all like like, you know, four line stanzas. Yeah. Um, and I like the first two lines that he had, which was, she's like the wind through my tree. She rides the night next to me. But then I didn't like the third and fourth lines and told him so, which made him def defensive. Yeah. And, um, uh, so he said, well, what would you say? So I said, um, you know, I was thinking nature imagery. So I said, she leads me through moonlight only to burn me with the sun. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't care. Just write it down. Yeah. And then we were off and running. And then I said, it's got to go someplace musically. So we came up with the, you know, kind of the pre-chorus or chorus idea, moving it to A minor and B minor. And then we had this ride down. And when we realized that She's Like the Wind was not just the opening line, but that it could also be be the title and the hook of the song that's when we knew we had something yeah. and we did a very smart thing and we did a, a really good demo of it with him singing it uh wendy singing on it who was a great singer um i programmed all the synths and drums brought in a guitarist and then ultimately it wasn't used for grand view <laughs> yeah and um, it sat in a drawer for a couple of years. And uh, then he was, I knew about Dirty Dancing. I'd met uh, the writer, Eleanor Bergstein, already and the choreographer, uh, Kenny Ortega. And uh, so he called me from um, North Carolina where they were shooting some of the film. And he said, hey, I just played the demo of She's Like the Wind for uh, the director and the producers, and they all love it, and they want to use it in the film. And, and my my comment to him was, you sure they're not just jerking you around because you're the star of the movie? Yeah. And he said, no, no, they're serious. And there's, there's this guy in New York who wants to talk to you, uh, Jimmy Einer, whom I heard of. And so I think it was the next day I spoke to Jimmy, and, you know, it seemed serious, uh, and so it was. Uh, it was licensed for uh, for the movie. And are you glad now, in hindsight, that it was rejected for Grand View because? It was in Dirty Dancing, which was even bigger. Yeah. Well, not not even nobody's ever heard of Grand View. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's yes. I I actually <laughs> thank the Lord every day or so that oh God, thank God it wasn't picked up for Grand View because <laughs> that movie faded into you know the the dustbin of obscurity. And uh, of course, you know, as, as John said, here we are years later talking about Dirty Dancing. 
So, uh, but but the thing was, nobody expected the movie or the soundtrack to be a hit. It, the word on the street was it was going to be an abject failure and spend about a week in the theaters and then go straight to video. And so it was a, a huge shock to almost everyone involved. Yeah. You've worked with Patrick Swayze on multiple occasions. So are there any kind of memorable stories from the time you've spent with him? Oh, sure. Tons. Because, um, uh, you know, we I knew him was friends with him up until his death yeah um and uh uh i think one of the funniest moments uh which i actually talked about at his memorial service he had a stupid car <laughs> he had a Delo- he had a delorean which was a nice looking car but did not run well did not drive well you're practically sitting lying down you know in the in the thing trying to drive it yeah. and i went with him in that car up to um the equestrian center he he wanted to see his horse and he had just gotten off in an off an airplane he called me at one o'clock in the morning and um you know so i went with him up there i said i said to wendy he said because she was like who who's calling at 1 a.m <laughs> um so uh we went to visit his horse it's now about two o'clock in the morning and uh he turned to me and it was becoming evident that maybe he'd had a couple of drinks on the plane or maybe a sedative and he said um i don't think i should drive back i think you should drive us back and i looked at him and i said i haven't driven a stick since high school and so at two o'clock in the morning he looked at me and he said, I'll teach you. So there we were in his DeLorean at, at the equestrian center with him telling me, now ease off the, you know, <laughs> flying thing into reverse was impossible. But finally, I got it moving and never left second gear. I just drove the entire way in wow. second gear, gripping the <laughs> steering wheel. So, so it was uh, that that that's one of many very funny stories that that we have. The together. car must have been making a lot of funny noises as well. Since it was a sports car, it was actually ah. could go pretty fast in gear. And the thing is, the route was not on the interstate or on the freeway. The route was over Laurel Canyon Boulevard, which was <laughs> yeah. even worse because that's like a wine finding path up and down <laughs> over a hill. So uh, that's why I was like, I am not shifting this thing. I'm not going to take yeah. it. So it was fine. Now, John, on your yes. debut solo album, you include a synth pop yes. version of Hungry Eyes. So how did you approach reimagining such a well-known song? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I that this was my first r- record as a, an artist. I, I never really thought of being an artist and it came about, I, I, I had just put equipment in this barn studio and I, I started having my son play drums and test the drum sound. And, and I started recording a, a, a couple of songs that I had written for other people, uh, whether they had been covered or not. Well, one was uh, uh, You're the Only One was the first one we kind of recorded. And that was uh, in a Sylvester Stallone movie called Avenging Angelo, sung by Steve Holy. But it never, it never, it was only in the movie it never was released it was only in the soundtrack not even there was no soundtrack so it was only in the movie so i always thought the song you know would would do well if it got covered again and and i i I started recording it and when it came time to put a vocal down I, i thought well let me just try it and that kind of snowballed. I said, well, what other songs can I sing as John Di Nicola that I had written for other people? And, um, you know, I came up with eight or nine. And then I was like, well, I, can I leave off Hungry Eyes? You know, and, and and I asked my son, who's, you know, he's like 29, 28. Well, he's probably like 25 <laughs> at the time. And he said... Um, he said, "Well, you know, a lot of uh, modern rock indie indie rock bands today kind of uh, draw from that '80s synth pop. So, you know, like a Kevin Parker or Tame Impala or Alex G. And and he said, uh, you know, why don't you approach it like that? And and we did. And he he had an idea for the drums. And um, so that was, you know, and I, it was I used the same synth that I wrote the song wow. on. It was a, a, a Roland Juno 106." Same yeah. sounds. A lot of indie pop rock bands are, are still using that synth. It's kind of like a go-to synth it was made in the 80s, but it's still a sound that people like. Uh, and then I was pretty well done. And then I said, I guess I have to do the time of my life, but how can I do the time? 
my life. I mean, it's it's an iconic song sung by iconic singers. And, uh, so uh, I just thought, well, let me just strip it way down and just singer songwriter. And I just took out this 60s acoustic guitar and um, sang it. I just sang a verse and a chorus yeah. and, and an outro and uh, put some French horns on. And, and that was it, because how else could I do the time yeah. of my life? So. You have to do it differently because it is a duet and you're singing it by yourself. But I suppose yeah. if you'd heard your version first, you wouldn't know that it was meant to be a duet. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, the, the words don't necessarily need to be yeah. a duet but uh, a little note on that that was one of the we were one of the only ones I'm not talking about me now i'm not talking now i'm talking about <laughs> dirty dancing we were the ones uh or at least one of the few maybe the only one that sent in a duet mm. for this for that scene so th I, that might have uh, helped i don't know Fra frankie sang the demo along with uh, a friend of mine rochelle capelli and uh, they, you know they really put it across well, and and again it obviously becomes you know Bill Medley becomes Patrick yeah. Swayze and uh, Jennifer Warnes becomes Jennifer Grey. I mean it's just inherent, you know. So yeah. yeah. Now we should mention there's a little fact about you, John, which is that you discovered a band called Maroon Five. So how did that discovery actually come about? Yeah, well they were actually called um, Kara's Flowers at the time. Um, they were a four-piece band, and I was working with a, a partner uh, for a production company, uh, Omad Productions, and um, Tommy was living out, Tommy Allen was living out on the West Coast, and he was walking down the beach in Malibu, and he heard some music coming out of some garage, <laughs> and he heard, he heard Kara's Flowers, you know, the same guys that are in Maroon 5, the same four guys, um, you know, um, Adam Levine, Jesse Carmichael, M Mickey Madden. And uh, at the time it was um, Ryan Dusick was the drummer. And, um, um, you know, we just grabbed him and went into the a couple of really nice studios and finished a record for them. And, um, you know, that record um, actually never, it, we, it's a long story, but it ended up on Warner Brothers Records and that didn't really take off. And, and so they broke up and then reformed as Maroon 5. And then, but, but you know, the, Adam, not so long ago when he was on The Voice, they asked um, each of the judges, um, what was your turnaround chair turnaround moment? And, you know, he mentioned uh, myself and, uh, and Tommy as, you know, we were the first ones to sort of bring them into the music. Yes. Yeah. So that's a good analogy, actually. Yeah. You were the voice judge that turned around. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And this is a question I suppose you can both answer. To what extent do you believe the music that you two composed for Dirty Dancing contributed to its success? I think it was all part of one organism, mm. uh, that it was a very clever idea on the part of, I guess it was probably mostly Jimmy Einer to, um, even though it was a period piece set in 1960 to include songs from that era, but then to add some modern songs at that time, what were modern songs. I think that was very clever, and I don't think that had been done, um, really. And it's funny because the anniversary date of uh, the first release of the album just passed was August 4th of 1987. And when the album was released, it absolutely tanked. It just, it, it almost didn't even make it to the charts. And Time My Life was released as the single, and it also just basically fell off. Then the movie came out and developed this immediate word of mouth. And the album, they did, a, I think, a little more uh, further promotional push. And the album and Time My Life, uh, you know, flew to number one. So it was all part of everything. And then the, the cleverness of picking up She's Like the Wind to be the romantic ballad sung by and co-composed by the romantic lead yeah. of the movie. So er everything kind of drove itself forward it, it was it was not one or the other i think it really was this combination of oh this is a great movie oh and have you heard the soundtrack album the soundtrack album is also great so it was it it, it really was a remarkable um coming together of some very uh serendipitous ingredients yeah. eleanor with eleanor bergstein who wrote it 
uh, actually wrote most of the 60s songs that were hits into the script. So, uh, it, and again, it was Jimmy Einer's idea to get another six songs um, that were original, new. I mean, Jimmy was a radio promo <laughs> guy, I mean, for foremost. So, you know, he said, we got, you know, if you're going to sell a soundtrack, you got to have new songs. You can't resell uh, Do You Love Me, you know, a few years later. Uh, although it did become a hit again, but it, you know, wouldn't have happened without the other original songs. And um, I think, I, I think Stacy's right at there, you know, the, it was a real combination, you know, the, by the way, the reason they released the time of my life before was the record uh, film company screwed up. They were supposed to release it on a certain date. And so the, the RCA records was promoting for that date. Then they pushed the film release back a month. So there was, there were, there were, there was a lot of <laughs> in that light it's quite a miracle because you know you like something yeah. like that it's dead it's done you put it out it's done jimmy kind of when the when the film came out jimmy re re um the the time of my life he had he told people that it was a remix it, wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> it was the same, the same version but now people had seen the movie and they yeah. cared you know and and I, I do agree also that at first the film pushed the soundtrack and then the soundtrack pushed the film. Yeah, without doubt. definitely. Well, is there anything that you're both working on at the moment? Any more kind of upcoming projects, musically or not? Well, I kind of fell into something about seven and a half years ago, almost eight years ago, and started doing black and white um, street photography. You know, people out on the street. Uh, it first started in, on a trip to Italy. Uh, a photographer friend saw what I was doing and said, this is really good. You now have to bring a camera with you wherever you go. And I did on subsequent trips to like um, Cuba <laughs> and um, uh, the UK and um, recently Paris uh, and uh, all over the Washington, D.C. places in, in this country. And it turned into a thing. I got my first show in 2019 and sold a few pieces. Uh, now I'm getting my fourth show uh, at Nashville Airport. They're uh, doing an exhibit of my work that will be up for four months, uh, which is great. All themed around London and Nashville. Um, and it's become a, a thing and I'm getting urged to do a book. Um, I've won seven awards uh, for the photography and now I think I've sold 13 or 14 pieces so far. So it's it's a whole new surprising and really enjoyable creative pursuit. Yeah, as for me, um, you mentioned uh, the why because was my first record uh, as an as an artist. Uh, I followed that up with a record called uh, called she said. Uh, all on the OMAD Records label, which is my record label, uh, OMADrecords.com. And, uh, you know, I, but I, I have multiple artists uh, that I release and I produce here. Uh, I just put out uh, Peter Lewis' second record on OMAD. Uh, a guy named Robert LaRoche, who was in a band called The Size from the 90s, but he's doing his own thing now. And uh also working, uh, uh, so, so there's, I would say, about six or seven artists now on, on OMED. Um, but we're also um, getting close. We just did the first um, full, unedited, full, full stab at a documentary called Fall on You. It's about, uh, again, Peter Lewis, um, who is, uh, he was in a band, an ill-fated band from the 60s, although it's a very influential band called uh, Moby Grape, which has a big following in the UK. Yep. Not a, not a, along with um, like Robert Plant is a huge fan, uh, little Stephen Beck um uh Chrissy Hind um anyway she was also he was also uh someone who you, you probably don't know Loretta Young was a big star uh, from the old old days um so um he has an interesting story and it's also about his daughter Arwen um who he is came late later on in, in her 20s and said can you teach me music so it's it's a kind it's a, it's an interesting documentary I think it's going to be my my son actually actually did the filming of it and uh it's a little it's a different than you know oh here's the old rock star you know um documentary there's some uh interesting uh, 
family uh, things going on in there. So that's that's on my yeah. plate. Well, where are we able to keep up to date with you both? Well, for me, I have a website, which is just www.stacywidelets.com. Um, and uh, then also to follow photography. Well, that's a mixture. Of, the website's a mixture of stories and music and photography. And then my Instagram page is exclusively for my black and white work. And that's just at AC Weidlitz. Um, it's not private, it's public. And I encourage everybody to take a look and, uh, uh, and it's, um, you know, the, but both sites, uh, uh, and I'm also on Facebook, um, you know, mainly for photography and making snarky comments on other people's posts. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a good way to follow me. We're trying to refrain from making snarky <laughs> comments. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I'm saying, you know, I said earlier, OMAD records, O-M-A-D records.com. There's also John Dean and all the uh, socials, uh, I believe it's all John DiNicola music um, for Instagram and Facebook. And, but, um, you know, I'm at records. We'll give you the um, sort of the whole background on all the artists on, on this label. Excellent. Well, many thanks to you both for talking to us today. It's been great having you here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.